This is the third Sunday of Advent, believe it or not. Um, you know, I kind of lost a week in there, but um, here we are, and it's, you know, just a couple more weeks then, and Christmas is here, so I hope you got your shopping done. But uh, Randy reminded us that, uh, really, this end of the year, uh, Christians own this end of the year. This is ours. This is ours. When we got a slot, you know, around Easter, but there's something about Christmas that really took on, and uh, it's given us, it gives us such a a platform to declare the Savior. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful time. And so uh, I think, you know, let's just, let's just go for it. And we know, we know that being Advent, you know, one of the reasons we do the Advent stuff is in the calendar, calendar calendar we've done and, and we pay attention to the calendars as it, as it rolls by, is to, is to prepare our hearts in a way that it keeps Christ in the center of what Christmas is about. Right? That's why we do this. This is why we do this. And so it sounds cliche, but Jesus is the reason for the season. Right? He always was. He will always be. But he's not just the reason for the season. He's also the message of Christmas. And so at Christmas then, and this has been our, our theme for Advent this year, is we bear witness. We bear witness of Christ at Christmas. You know what else we do at Christmas? We give gifts. Have you noticed that? If you haven't, go down to Walmart. They'll, they'll explain it to you. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and and they would start explaining to you know they don't want you to be late so they start in August I think <laughs> and so but I'm not there um, but we give gifts at Christmas and I remember talking to some people one time and um, I was I was studying sort of, these were Christians and they didn't know why we give gifts at Christmas it was just uh, tradition well just in case someone else may have missed it um, we give gifts at Christmas because God gave us the best gift, the greatest gift. And in that, we also see then, because a gift is an expression of love, we see, we see that Christmas is really about God's love for us. And so we bear witness. As we, as we spend time with friends and bump into people at Walmart and, and wherever else we may shop, and it's a little hard to spread um, the gospel at, at, on Amazon, but, uh, you know, it might be some way. But as we bump into people and explain to them what it is we're about, we bear witness of, of the greatest love. We let him know. We let these people we're speaking to, we let them know that God loves them so intensely that he did an extremely radical, out-of-the-box, unconventional thing to express that love for us. And, and how is it that he came to give such a gift to us? That line from one of the old Christmas songs that, that he came for poor, ornery sinners like you and like me. Why would he do that? So at Christmas, you know, we look at a bunch of Christmas verses and, and we're, you know, you've, you've heard him a million times, right? But we, but we look forward to hearing him again because this is what we talk about here. You know, in Isaiah seven fourteen, you guys know what that one is? Behold, I will give you a sign. A ver you may know that one. So, <laughs> I have no idea what they're doing on the screen behind me, so I, I hope it's polite. Better off. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> better off. <laughs> For behold, I will give you a sign. This verse is actually a rebuke. He's rebuking the king because he's Isaiah has been uh, speaking for God and and. God has been offering this man a sign of deliverance and he won't he won't take it because he's really he doesn't believe in God and he doesn't want to trust God he knows God's out there but he doesn't want to trust him which just just bends my mind and so it says behold then and if you're not going to ask for a sign then I will I will give you one behold a, a virgin shall conceive and have a son she will bear a son and his name will be what? Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with, God with us. And this is this is not the first, by any means, the first hint of Christ's coming or of his love for us. But he's choosing to be with us. One of the one of the, the greatest signs to Israel 
that Israel was God's people and he cared about them and he was, he was maintaining his love for Abraham and all of his descendants was that the, the temple or the tabernacle before that sat in the very center of the camp of Israel. And it came out in the shape of a, of a cross with all the tribes camped out there. And then in the middle was the tabernacle where God dwelled in the very center of their lives. And everything looked toward him. And so when he says God is with us, they understood that concept. And so this, though, is speaking of a time when, when God would come. And he didn't quite understand it yet. It wasn't explained very well. But he would come as a, as a man. He would come as a human. Not someone who would become God, but one who had always been God. And it would be God, the one God, the very God, with us. So it, it's this start, this expression, this amazing love that he's, he's expressing one way after another in all these really impressive ways. But look at Isaiah chapter 9. You guys know this one too. It's another one of those, those verses that we've, we've heard a million times, at least, at least as many Christmases as you've been alive. Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Wrap your head around that one. There will be no end to the what? Increase. Increase. I don't really know what all that means. But what that means, in, at least is that all power and all authority will be his. Mm -hmm. And however the world may change or grow or shift or whatever, it's still going to be contained within his authority and his power. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. I love the next line. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Can you hear that idea of love in there? This is what we bear witness to. These, these verses we use bear witness of the coming of the Savior and why he came and what he will accomplish. And zeal, it's only four letters, but zeal is actually a very powerful word. Mm -hmm. It is a passion that consumes your whole life. And it's fascinating to me, amazing to me, astounding to me that God has a zeal and that zeal is for your salvation the God of all creation has zeal for your life now we know that when we put our faith in Christ that um, that, that salvation is secured but there are a lot of people out there that don't have that yet and there's some people standing on the edges. They're trying to compromise a little bit with this and that. And where they, you know, you know, when I'm older and I've sown my oats, you know, you've, you've seen that, I'm sure. Maybe some of us lived it. So we don't have to worry about the security of our salvation once we put our faith in it. But to think that this is God's passion. This is his, this is his heartbeat is for your life. It's an amazing thing. There's other verses we talk about at Christmas. Those verses are really about Christ to come because they were, they were written certainly before Jesus came. And so th those bear witness. They bear witness of Christ to come. But we, we read other verses, you know, in, in Matthew and Luke, we read about this, this census under Quirinius and Augustus Caesar, and we, we read about that, and we read about the, the, the journey on the donkey, which had to be just miserable when you're, you know, nine plus months along, you know, ready to, ready to deliver. She just had to be miserable on that trip, but, you know, they were sterner stuff in those days. We read about an inn that had no room. We read about angels and shepherds and magi that come from the east and come to worship him who was born king of the Jews. 
But today I'd like to look at something a little bit different. I want to look at a, most of those are like on the, on one side of your Bible. You, you know what I mean? It's kind of on one side of your Bible. I want to go to one on the other end of your Bible. It isn't often recognized as a Christmas verse. Look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4 is one of those chapters that everybody ought to spend months just soaking in and soaking in and soaking in. Uh, John, the way John writes, he writes like a poet, and his writing is so dense, it's so artistic, but there's so much theology in this, and every little phrase is loaded with something that you have to just unpack for a while. Anyway, and this verse is no exception. But 1 John 4, 9 says, By this, the love of God was manifested where? In us. Notice it doesn't say to us. That's implied. But it's manifested in us. What does manifest mean anyway? Manifest with something when it shows up inside, when it's when it's it's actually present. It's, it appears. That's what manifest means. It's something right there that you can put your hands on. It's 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 genuine, it's concrete, it's real. And so here we have by this the love of God was manifested in us. How's that? That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And there's that zeal again. And we bear witness at this season, we bear witness that God came into the world so that we might live through him. Have you thought, have you thought how precious life is? Some of us have been in situations where their life may, be, may have been in the balance. So you know. But he gave us this son so that we would live. Now imagine, imagine yourself with some dread disease where you're not watching movies and playing with puppies. <laughs> and you're actually really in danger. What would it mean to you for someone to appear and make that disease stop and your life can continue it would be an amazing thing how would you put that into words right how precious is your life what will a man give for his life what will a man pay for his life we can't put a mission out on that but but when we see this amazing love i, want, I don't want you to lose i don't want you to lose track of that little preposition in us this love of god was manifested in us hold on to that so we bear witness of his love at, at christmas but before that god bears witness of his love for the world at christmas look at luke chapter 2. i mean it's christmas we got to go to luke 2 right luke chapter 2 I can't read it as well as Linus, but I'll do the best I can. No one can. Um, just an aside, um, before I became a Christian, uh, you know, I was just a kid, and I was watching Charlie Brown Christmas, and they read this passage. I had never heard it before, and that just changed. It changed everything. Suddenly it stopped being religion and tradition and suddenly it became, this is real. There was something about those words that this was real. I couldn't explain it. I just knew it. So Amen. thank you, Linus. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we'll pick up with verse one. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his, own seat, to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In that same region, 
There were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, <laughs> I love this line, do not be afraid. I, I hope there was a certain conviction in the voice of that angel that they really go, okay, well then what is this about? But I just find it really hard to imagine that they weren't continuing to be terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. When the angels had gone away from them in heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. They bore witness. God lovingly expresses to these guys, listen to the, listen to the, the ex you could hear the excitement in the voice of this angel. Don't be afraid, because today I bring you glad tidings of great joy. And he announces to them that this is the Christ, this is the Messiah, that they knew from Isaiah would be the one that would bear the sins of, of mankind, that they knew was the son of David. They knew that eventually this child, they didn't understand the chronology yet, but, but they knew that this child would overcome all the evil in the world and set things right. And that Israel would have all of the promises fulfilled to them that had been promised. They knew this. This is an expression of a great love. When you put it together and kind of do the math, one wonders just how many years these promises had been hanging there for the Messiah to come. It could have been 2,000. It could have been more. We really don't know the gap between, um, between um, creation and, and Noah's flood. We don't really know how long that went. Um, it could have been several thousand years. I don't know. I, I think the earth is young. I think that fits the facts much better. But um, still, here are these guys, just working class guys, and the angels came to them. Isn't that interesting? They came to them and said, we have glad tidings of great joy. And you hear the zeal of God ringing through this angel's voice. Can you hear it? Have you thought to see it that way? Hear the emotions. When you're reading your Bible, just as a, an aside here, when you're reading your Bible, listen for the emotion of the person speaking. Even if it's an epistle, right? But listen for the emotion of the person speaking. And it'll be, it'll be amazing for you. If you haven't tried it, it'll be amazing how much more stuff comes up out of that simple text. So, anyway. So he gives this good news to the shepherds. You all know John 3.16, I hope, right? I mean, if you watch football, you know John 3.16. For God so, at least the reference. For God so loved the world, he so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There, there have been preachers through through history that that rail and rant um, thunder may be better that God hates sinners and I, I, I can't get I can't make that sit with this verse mm -hmm. for God so loved the world and well you know what, what he means by the world there is, is he means and they, they kind of puff and blow and he means the, 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 the believers in the world that he's called out and they go through all these gymnastics the problem is, world there is cosmos. It's the same. It's the same word that's used for the system under satanic domination. Same word, and it can be just a generic word that means like creation, 
but it's also used in conjunction with the world system that's run by demons and, and Satan. So you can't really make that argument stick. I mean, they try hard, and it's, it's impressive. I mean, it's impressive. If you've read someone's arguments, it's, it's impressive what they can do. God is certainly angry with sinners. We shouldn't overlook that. He's very angry. But you know, a lot of emotions can exist together at the same time, can't they? You can love someone deeply and be very angry with them. And this is what we see going on with, with him. God doesn't hate sinners, but there will come a time, there will come a time when his patience runs out and he will clean house and he will, he will call to himself those who have been redeemed and the rest will be destroyed. A chilling thing but this is what he's going to do so even though he doesn't hate sinners and he's very very angry with them we still have verses like romans 5 10 for if while we were enemies remember this verse for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to god through the death of his son comma much more he says having been reconciled we shall be saved by his what by his life by his life. That's why he came. That's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. It's about saving your life. That's why it's such an amazing gift. See, we were on our way to hell. I don't have to belabor that. When Adam sinned, he took us all with him. Well, that's not fair. Well, fairness has nothing to do with it. When Adam, was, when Adam was told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that in that day he would surely die, right? Adam died. You know, Ephesians 2, 1, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. He died. He had no life to pass on. We get so caught up in what uh, A.W. Pink calls the, the gospel of Satan, which I think is really interesting description is that somehow we get confused that this is like the earth is some kind of a testing ground that we're supposed to um, work really hard and earn some kind of a pass into heaven. This is not how this works. This, it never worked like this. We were always lost. We were born dead because Adam never had life to pass on in the first place. So when he died, every descendant of him no longer had life either. He didn't have it to pass on. This is why we have to be born again. This is why we had to be given life. And so because we were born, we were basically stillborn, we were born without a living spirit, then automatically, because we didn't have that life, then we were automatically separated from God, and we continue to live that out. That's why our behavior can be so deplorable. Have you noticed? First of all, we're born this way. So have you noticed you never have to tell a toddler how to lie? Don't go to teach a kid to be bad. Have you, have you noticed that? How, why is that? Because this is how we're born. We're born separated from God. And uh, what they used to say in the, in the good old days was sinners sin. Mm -hmm. Saints follow. And so it changes the way, it changes the way we, we saw the world. We were born this way. And so God had interrupted that. So he came and inv in, invaded history. And, and we bear witness of that, that amazing expression of love. Okay. Sorry, printed, printed funny. First John 4, 9, by this the love of God was manifested in us. <coughs> that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. We bear witness of God's love for every believer. We bear witness that he loved us and he left heaven to be with us. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He left heaven. Now this, it's really very much the same thing as Isaiah 7, 14. God with us, 
which call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And this child then that was predicted was going to be one who left heaven. Look at Philippians chapter 2. He left heaven for us. Imagine that. Have, have you noticed? Have you noticed that this is not heaven? Uh, we, don't, we don't live in heaven. In Philippians chapter 2, we'll pick up with verse 6. It says a little something about, I mean, this is, this is a packed theological statement. Uh, and it's been debated and stuff for, for centuries. But it's, it's a, a phenomenal thing. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. He's talking about Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God. Stop there for a second. God exists in heaven as a spirit. We do not have sensory apparatus to see a spirit. Unless that spirit has some ability to create sensory experience, we have no way of knowing that that spirit's there. So far, so good? We cannot sense God on our own. One, we're separated from him, we're blinded by the flesh, but we don't have the sensory stuff to be able to see him. But in that existence, in creation, before, before creation, we had God existing still as a trinity, always as a trinity, only as a trinity. And so he existed together in perfect unity, in perfect love, those three persons. You with me so far? Now that, to me, sounds like a perfect existence, an ideal existence. To be loved by the Father, to be loved by the Spirit, to be loved... By, by Jesus and all, all, all of them together in that amazing peacefulness. And he left that. He left that. He left that to become one of us. We bear witness of that astonishing statement of, of love and affection. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, we think of grasp as reaching out to take something, but this is the kind of grasp where you're clutching and holding on to it. It's not mine. Anyway, um, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is not saying that he stopped being deity. There's groups out there that say that. I understand the Bethel movement is one of them that this is what they're saying, that uh, Jesus stopped being God while he was a man, and then he went back to being God. Uh, that doesn't fit scripture. It doesn't fit scripture. It doesn't, it doesn't fit common sense. How could God stop being God then become God again? Plus, well, resurrect people. I'm sorry. He couldn't be the sacrifice of people. Exactly true. Exactly true. Yes, sir. So, did you read my notes? <laughs> it's exactly. It's perfect. It's perfect. So we bear witness. We bear witness that He loved us enough to come and be with us. To be one of us. See, one of the reasons why, and this is a, this is a little heady. I mean, there's a lot of heady stuff in this today, but one of the reasons why God allowed Adam to die, <coughs> and humanity then, since him, has a limited lifespan and dies. If we could die, and that is the the, the cost, the punishment, if you will, the wages of sin, which is death, physical death, spiritual death, then God could take our place mm -hmm. and die for us and interrupt that. This is why the demons cannot have salvation. This is why the angels look into the gospel and long to understand because they simply don't have a grasp of that concept. We know what death is. But this is why death in itself is a terrible mercy that he could in interrupt by taking our place 
and offer his life in death for you and for me. And in this, the great love of God is manifest in us. That we would be saved by his life. And we bear witness of this because that's what Christmas is about. We bear witness that he died an unspeakable death on the cross, but that death was a propitiation. You know this verse, 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. He cleaned the whole creation with his death. And you know what propitiation is? It's this over-amazing, over-abundant payment, more than the actual asking price. And so he swamped the demand of law and, and righteousness and holiness. He swamped the demands with his precious blood, with his great life for you and for me. We bear witness of that. We bear witness of his love for us, that it gives us life instead of judgment. John 5, 24, you know this one too. You know a lot of these verses now, don't you? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal, eternal life. life. And does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. This is an astounding thing. This is a wonderful thing. We bear witness that this life, that this life that he gave us from him is his own very life. I want to unpack this a little bit, but grab your Bible, look at John chapter 5. You know some of these verses, I hope. John chapter 5. He says in verse 26, John 5, 26. For just as the Father has what? Life. Life in himself. Even so, he gave the Son also to have life in himself. He's talking about the incarnation. And life in himself, we don't have time to really unpack all the theology here because there's, there's, there's books of theology in just these little phrases. But when he says life in himself, he's talking about the kind of life that only God has, that has no beginning, it has no end, it was never created, it will never come to an end. It is self-sufficient. It never, it is never reduced, no matter how much energy it puts out. It is self-sustaining. It needs to take nothing in. It is completely independent of anything else. He has life self-contained in himself. With me so far? That's a big idea. For just as the Father has life in himself, in even so, which is a really fancy, fancy Greek phrase that means even so, same way, he gave to Jesus to have life in himself. Now back up to verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, it's a fancy Greek term, even so, the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Now the question that's begging in that verse is, where did he get that life to give away? He got it from the Father. And that life is life in himself. Tracking me here? So what is that the life, what kind of life then that is it that Jesus gives to you? Eternal, eternal, eternal life that has no beginning and has no end. He's actually giving you the very same life, not one like it, but the very same life that the Father gave to him. This is an amazing thing. I will never get over that concept. That born in Adam, even if Adam had not fallen, we would only have had a human life. It may have been immortal in some way, but it was only going to be a human life. And when God saved us, he took that old dead life out of us, crucified it, buried it, and raised us again. When he raised us again, he gave us his own life in its place. A life that can never be destroyed. It was never created. It will never be, it will never cease to exist. It doesn't come under judgment. It is independent of the fall. It is independent of creation. This is a huge idea. And in this verse, he says, by this love of God was, by this the love of God was manifested in us, 
that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the greatest love. So you and I are no longer average humans. And we have Homo sapien, the thinking man, which is a dubious title, I think. <laughs> but, but there is this, there is a new kind of creature on earth, the, the, the Homo Christus, the man in Christ, the man who belongs to God, the man who has a different life than the rest of the race. This is who you are. This is what you are. By simple faith and faith alone, this is what you are. Nothing less. It's an astounding thing. And we've got these other verses, you know, like Colossians 3, 4, that says, and, and when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, we will be revealed with him in glory. So just as he was crucified, buried, and raised, and that happened to you, when he is revealed in glory, because you have his life, you will be revealed with him in glory. He will rule in heaven. He will rule in Jerusalem physically. And he will rule over the angels. Because he does, and you have his life, you will. Yeah. Are you letting this like stretch your mind a little? This is enormous. See, the problem with, is not that Christians think too highly of themselves. The thing is, we don't think highly enough of ourselves. We try to throw ourselves into some kind of of false humility and false false smallness. And we've lost track of what it is that the gospel has done for you. We have nothing to brag about. Nothing to brag about. But this is what God has chosen in his sovereign grace, in his amazing wisdom, to make you to be now. Nothing less. We need to stop looking at ourselves in the mirror and wondering, and wonder if we are lovable people, if we are worthy people. We need to stop being afraid to speak up about who we are. We have to understand who God has made us to be, what we have become in his presence. So we bear witness that this gift of his life means that God the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. No difference. How is that possible? Well, the logic of it is, if you have the same life as Jesus, then wouldn't the Father love you just the same as he loves his Son who has that life, right? Mm -hmm. Now, logic, logic can make things walk on all fours, right? So we have to have a verse for that. And maybe some of you know where we're going on this. John 17, 23. I, I wish I could find some people, you know, that that they've read this so many times, so many times, so many times, that the words of this verse are just rubbed off the page. So you trace each phrase with your finger to see how amazing this love is for what, what God has done for us. He says in verse 23, John 16, 23, he's praying for the disciples. Now, this is, this is the high priestly prayer. He's about to be arrested. And so he's there with the disciples and he's praying some astounding things through this whole chapter. But he says, I and them, and he's talking to the Father, right? And so he's saying, I, this is Jesus, right? I and them, who's the them? Us. Yeah, right. And it's, it's, it's the disciples right there, but when you look at verse 20 before that, he's saying, this is going to apply to everybody else that believes because of their word. That's us. And so he says, I and them, and you, who's that? The Father, in me, Jesus, that they, the disciples, may be perfected in, perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Yes, it is. We'll get there. But he goes on, he says, Father, I desire... Now listen to the affection here. <clears throat> Listen to the Father's affection for you and Jesus' affection for you. We're not going to unpack everything here. We don't have time. But Father, I, des I desire that they also, whom you have given to me. Have you ever met somebody that just seemed to be like, this guy just thinks he's God's gift to women? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you look at this verse, even superficially, you may not be God's gift to women or God's gift to men, but what you are is you are God's gift to Christ. Mm -hmm. You are a gift to him. And he's glad to have you. Mm -hmm. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. Father, I want them to be with me. That's what he's asking. So that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me, what? The love with which you love me may be in, may them. Be in them. May be in them. The love that the Father has for Jesus. How big is that? Huge. Huge. It's not just that the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. We see that in verse 17 or 23. It's that now the <clears throat> Father has planted his love in us so that we love Jesus with that same love that the Father has for him. We bear witness of the greatest love. So once that love is in us and that he will be in them, in us, we bear witness that just being in the presence of the life of Christ transforms us into something we were never before. We are creatures who are able to love. And in this, he wants us to be with him, to share in that glory. We already saw that in Colossians 4. This is a lot, right? I'm giving you a lot here. But this is what God's salvation has given for you at Christmas. That's what Christmas is about. We bear witness of the amazing affection that God the Father has for everyone who has the life of Christ. We bear witness of God's love by Christ loving through us. He's implanted this love in us. John 13, 35, old verse you should know, by this all men know that you are my, will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. There's an old Roman document that still exists, one of the, some Roman official was saying that he didn't really understand the Christians very well, but he knew this, that before they meet each other, they love each other. Isn't it amazing? You know, you meet someone, maybe some, some stranger at work, and then you find out they're a believer, and all of a sudden you have a relationship with this person, right? We can't help it. We can't help it. Because the love of the Father in us, for Jesus, sees them somehow, and then loves them too. And it's already transforming us. But this is, this is what... This is the love that we, we know as agape love. It's the kind of love that God has for us. It's sacrificial. It is, it is sanctifying. It is transforming. It makes us into something different than we were before. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is that... Let's just look it up. Important verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Last verse in chapter. He made him who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's transforming us. We become this, this new nature that, that God is like, that Jesus is like. The love of Christ for him, the love of Christ for him and from him within us transforms us into his image. You know, in Romans chapter 8, that whom he, he called, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. That we would be conformed to his image. He's not just, he's not just loving us. He's not just, he's not just um, 
washing us clean. He's changing us into his image so that we will be like him. Think of all the gifts you might get at Christmas. Isn't transformation into, into being like Jesus Christ, isn't that the most amazing gift? There is no gift greater than that. He's given us his life. He wasn't satisfied with that. He's now going to conform us to be like his son. And it's very much like that leper that Jesus touched first before he transformed. He saved us in our lostness, in our sin, in our death, in our, in our uncleanness. He touched us there and now transforms us into health, into being something lovable and beautiful that is suitable to be presented in glory when Jesus himself is. And Christmas for us is a time for us to bear witness to all of that. And in, in Romans 13, 8, let's look at that one fast. This says something about the kind of love that we have. Agape, agape love is the kind of love that's sanctifying, is transforming, is sacrificial. In Romans 13, pick up with verse 8. He says, owe nothing to anyone except to, what? To love one another. For he who loves, this is that word agape, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not cover. What is he quoting? What's he referring to? The commandments. So he's talking about the law, the commandments. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So we have to, unfill, we have to unpack this and, and see what it's all filled with. That agape love is, is more than just not doing the wrong things. It certainly will not, it will not practice evil against its neighbor. It won't. Because it, it cares about that person's welfare. It cares about that person's transformation. It cares about that person's future. And so that love then refuses to sin. So this isn't just warm affection. You know, there are four Greek words for love. One of them is storge, and that's the one that doesn't appear in the New Testament, oddly enough. I think that is a bit odd. But storge is the relationship affection that you have for people. You know, people that you just kind of hang out with and you get to know them really well and you just sort of get attached to them. Or maybe it's somebody in your family, you've just always been with them. That's a different kind of love, because that love may have no impact on the other person's status, on their, on their well-being. It may not necessarily sacrifice for them. It's affectionate. But this kind of love has a much bigger view, a much bigger vista that it stands before and tries to see how do we help, how do we help this person that I love this way move to a place where they too know Jesus Christ and their life is now being conformed to the image of Christ. Are you with me on that? Yes. That's the fundamental difference between agape love and everything else. It's all about that transformation. And in 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to pick that up again. I should have had you just keep your thumb in there because we keep going back there. 1 John 4, we'll pick up verse 7. This word uniformly here when we see love is agape. So don't lose that. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Agape love is the kind of love that only God really has. He gives it to us, he implants it in us, but it's the kind of love that only he can have. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, this may seem a little obscure for a second, but when he says the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love, this eliminates, this eliminates churchianity. Churchianity is about power. <coughs> churchianity is about posturing. Churchianity is about, is about legalism and, and the flesh trying to conform itself to godliness. It knows nothing of grace, no matter what it says. In reality, it knows nothing of grace. So the one, and so that there's not love in that, because it's not able to transform. 
it commands the follower to transform himself. Agape operates differently. It operates internally so that person can then be transformed. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know that's an experiential kind of love or kind of kind of knowledge. It's not just information. It's not that we've understood the four spiritual laws. We have come to know. That is, we have experienced this. We've experienced and have believed, that is, entrusted ourselves to him. We've come to experience the love which God has for us, and we've trusted ourselves to the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, brought to completion, brought to maturity, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. You know, remember as Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. When we put our faith in Christ, and he, has, he is the embodiment of that love from God the Father to us, it changes us. It transforms us. It makes us into something we could not have been before. So at Christmas, we bear witness of the greatest love. God gave us this love at Christmas. How do you give love? How do you give it like a thing? How do you? Well, he wrapped it in human flesh and he laid it in the manger. And when we put simple faith in Christ, he wraps us in Christ. And that love then becomes a part of us. And his love and his nature in us then transforms us into his image. The penalty for our sin is washed away forever, and his life becomes our life. No longer in Adam, but his life is now our life. So when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, which is his, the life that I now live, I live, live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We bear witness. We bear witness of the greatest love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this indescribable gift. Thank you for a love so, so unique, so different from what we understand in our fallenness, so rich, so vast, that it cleanses from evil, it leads us into a relationship with you, it peels the scales from our eyes so that we can see God. Lord, we thank you for this at Christmas. I pray, Lord, as we enjoy the other gifts we get and, and enjoying all the other love we experience with other people, that we never lose sight of what Christmas is really about. 
and call us then to bear witness to people who need to know the Savior. We thank you for this great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.